to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hello there, how are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is brought to you by Kraken, the best place to buy, sell, and trade Bitcoin. I'm your host, Peter McCormack, and today I have the penultimate episode in my Bitcoin Beginner's Guide. I have an interview with Jeremy Welch, one of my favorite people to jam with on Bitcoin, and we discuss the future of Bitcoin. But before that, I have a message from my show sponsors. So first up today, it is Coin Tracker, and I just want to say a big thanks to John Chandon and EJ for supporting the show and being a sponsor, and also dealing with some of the feedback with tax season upon us. They wanted to sponsor the show, but I've had some people get in touch. I've had some people say, why are you allowing a tax company to sponsor the podcast? Tax is immoral. Okay, so let's get into this. Yes, some of you disagree with tax. I disagree with tax. I disagree with the levels of taxation, but it is a reality. If you do not pay your tax, you do run the risk of being pursued by the authorities. And we do know that exchanges are now being subpoenaed. So listen, I pay my tax because I don't want to get a big fine and I don't want to end up in jail, but it does not mean I agree with it. So if you want to pay your tax or if you don't want to pay your tax, it is up to you. But for those who do, you got to check out Coin Tracker because it makes it so easy to do. You can load up your exchanges and your wallets and within a couple of minutes, your tax is calculated. Their filings work in the US, UK and Canada. And if you've got 200 or fewer transactions in a year, then it's free. And for listeners of the show, if you've got more than 200 transactions, you can get a 10% discount by using the link cointracker.io forward slash A forward slash WBD. And Cointracker is C-O-I-N-T-R-A-C-K-E-R. And we are just a couple of months away from consensus when everybody will be descended on New York for beers and Bitcoin. And consensus always manages to bring all the biggest names in the industry into the city. We've had Hester Pierce. Brian Armstrong, Jack Dorsey, and last year we had Andrew Yang, and this year will be no different. But not just great speakers, they get everybody in the industry together to hang out, to grab a coffee, to grab a beer, to go to a party, and just catch up, do some business, and talk Bitcoin. And like the last two years, I will be there. So if you want to hang out, if you want to talk Bitcoin and grab a beer, then make sure you're in New York for this year's event and let me know where you will be. I would love to hang out with some of you, catch up, and jam some Bitcoin with you. And if you want to get a ticket, they have a special discount for the listeners of this show. If you use the code Bitcoin Did, you can get $200 off your ticket price. You can find out more and book your tickets at consensus2020.com, which is C-O-N-S-E-N-S-U-S 2020.com. And lastly, but no means least, in this intro, my new sponsor, Sat Street, has officially launched. And today, they're going to kick things off with a big 10 million Sats Bitcoin giveaway. I'm going to be announcing this on my Twitter, so keep an eye on that. That will be later today. Well, it might be in the past if you've uh, if you only just listened to it, but it will be up on my Twitter. Now, Sat Street is the easiest way to send Bitcoin to everyone you know, as you can gift Bitcoin to your friends by email. But not only that. Sat Street gives you or your friends easy ways to earn Bitcoin by bringing together all the top referral programs in the industry into one place. Sat Street will reward you for every person you invite that earns Bitcoin, and newcomers get to learn about Bitcoin and earn Sats at the same time. You are rewarded for growing the network, which is pretty cool, right? You want to find out more and want to earn some Bitcoin? You want to help Bitcoin grow? And then check out Sat Street today by visiting satstreet.com, which is S A T S T R E E T.com. All right, so onto the show. And today I have my buddy Jeremy Welch back on the show. Always brings a fire when talking about Bitcoin. And as I get to the end of this Bitcoin beginner's guide for this, the penultimate show, we are looking ahead at what the future holds for Bitcoin, how Bitcoin will scale to handle mass adoption, how governments around the world will react to hyper Bitcoinization, and what will the societal shift be. We get into all this and a lot more, so I hope you enjoy this as much as I do. Also, with this series coming to end, I would love your feedback. I want to know what you thought of it, so do let me know. If you want to get in touch, my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Jeremy, how are you, man? Doing well. Doing well, Peter. Good to hear from you. So I've been doing this beginner's guide to Bitcoin. It's gone down really well, actually. Very popular. The average show downloads are pretty high on this. People have really enjoyed it. And I've covered everything. I started with Andreas, where we did why we need Bitcoin. I've covered the technicals with Shinobi. I've tried to steer people away from altcoins with Nick. But 15 shows in now, and I've got two to go. And one of them I wanted to cover was the future of Bitcoin. And I had to do it with you because I don't know if you remember the show where we did where I think it was titled Bitcoin Changes Everything. I just felt like you were the right guy for right. this. So 
You ready for this? Awesome, awesome. Yeah, let's dive in. So, There's a ton to cover. Loads to cover. And I, I know we're dealing with the world of opinions here. It's kind of subjective and predictions are hard, but still, I think it might be useful to tell people like a, a little story of when I met with you and Alex Gladstein when we we're in San Francisco and you started telling me about all yeah. these books you've been reading. And so you're always thinking about the future and aren't you? And like predictions and what's been happening and you in your, I, I'm the way I see it is that you see where Bitcoin fits into this future. Yeah, Peter. So the, uh, you know, the future of Bitcoin is really embedded in a, a kind of a bigger set of trends, a bigger set of system changes. And um, Snow Crash is a great, great conception of where this future could go. There's uh, Neil Stevenson himself, like the, the writer has a few other books. The Diamond Age is another one too. Um, but beyond that, it's, you know, I, I think it goes a little bit beyond sci-fi um, into uh, something that, that just doesn't even look like anything that's in a book or out of a book. It's just something kind of totally new and totally unique. And Bitcoin represents something, a lot of old ideas in terms of hard currency, but with a lot of new ideas in terms of um, you know, computation and uh, predictability and uh, auditability, open source tech. And the future that, that comes out of that is, is uh, something that's pretty exciting. And so you know, I think that's, that's what we were touching on is, is, um, it, in, in that conversation with Alex is just that both the, you know, the human rights implications and also just the, the kind of economic implications and then the kind of political and societal implications. So there's a lot to talk about on uh, the technical side uh, of Bitcoin. And, but I, I actually think uh, you know, the next few years of Bitcoin are going to be kind of boring, uh, and that's actually a good thing, right? It's a good thing that, that things are boring. Like it's you know people are used to Bitcoin. There's a lot more knowledge around Bitcoin. Uh, there are some major changes coming, technical changes coming, even this year. So we've got the Taproot coming up and uh, Schnorr signatures and some things like that. But the, I think the more interesting thing, and, and the you know if you're talking about the future of Bitcoin, it's it's really going to be a story of Bitcoin being consistent and boring and stable and uh, as a you know as a view as a technology. But then the world is changing around it, right? Like with Bitcoin being that stable, you know, how does the world politically, societally, everything else change um, as a result of that kind of rock uh, of stability? And one of the things it's difficult to just look at the future without considering the past. And I think for me, with regards to you, it'd be good to understand where, where did it really click for you? Because we all have that kind of first time we hear about Bitcoin. For me, it was a Silk Road and I started using it as a currency. But it, I would say it was probably three to four years after that where it actually started to click okay. to me about the bigger societal impact this could have. Um, where did it really click for you? For me, I, it's been a... Um I would say it's been an ongoing thing, and this is kind of how I view view uh, several different areas of technology. the The initial implications happened for me years ago. I mean, this is so. I I, I was in New York City doing tech startups into 2010, 2011. I, I dropped out and I would left uh, Duke University a couple years before that, um, where I was studying political philosophy and interested in some of these questions of capitalism and and systems theory and. I went back to Duke, like I went back uh, around, uh, this is, uh, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014. And while I was there is when I really started digging into Bitcoin, found it and, uh, and, and read about it and then really started digging into the potential implications. And I think, so I think that I had this context, I, I went through the financial, I was in New York City during the financial crisis uh, in 2009 and I uh, saw the, you know, firsthand, I, I wasn't working in the financial industry, I was working in the ad tech industry, uh, but I learned a ton of things around how the kind of big tech works at that time. And then uh, I also had this experience to where I, the, uh, uh, most of my friends at the time coming from university, a lot of them were working at these banks. And so I heard a lot of kind of back channel stories from them. And then uh, all of that then compounded to I had this break because we sold the company into Google and I stayed there a year and then I left and I went back to Duke to, to finish my degree. And I, I, I had this, you know, I took a kind of a more of an independent study path to where I was able to just go hang out with a lot of really smart people and uh, also just study things that I wanted to. And it was during that time that I really dug in and it was during that time that I really started to understand the potential implications even, uh, you know, uh, there, there's some stuff around even like the, the Triffin dilemma from, you know, very large problems with the global financial system that it has these implications on. Then there's also these kind of technology and local trust problems that it has these implications on. But a lot of it started to click then. And then I would say that the last really six years has been 
I, that's crazy to say, but the last five, six years um, has really been a, a kind of process of proving out that those things are real. So it's a, you know, the initial, uh, the initial kind of learnings and the initial um, uh, realization happened a while ago uh, that the potential was there, but you know, in any kind of technology in any kind of system, you have the understanding the potentials of that system. And then you have, you know, it actually playing out and realizing that potential. And I would say, you know, the last, uh, especially three or four years has been a lot of very fast uh, realization of potential. And then, you know, that's where my, my view that, a lot of these things are already hard set, right? So that's why the kind of Bitcoin itself is going to be kind of boring, but everything around it is going to go faster and faster and faster in terms of uh, how things change. All right. So like, let's go fully big picture here then. What are the real potentials here? How far can Bitcoin take us? How far can it go? And when answering that, it would, it would be good to answer where you think we are in kind of the the lifespan of this. You know, What are the things that you've seen, the key milestones that you think we've uh, we've achieved so far? So I would say that one of the biggest key milestones is just broad-based recognition of Bitcoin. And whether that's yeah. whether someone's pro or con, um, they're at least aware of it. Uh, and just the awareness itself gives an opportunity for that awareness to change from negative to positive. Not being aware of it and not being aware of the basic properties means that you're kind of still lost in this world of thinking that something like this can't even exist but well, so let me just sorry just to interrupt you so i was at an uh, event recently a tone phase one and it, i was on a panel moderating a panel and it was called the road to mass adoption and one of the things i right. said is that i think we're already at mass awareness and the reason i said that is everywhere i go when somebody says to me oh what do you do for a living i have a bitcoin podcast and almost never does somebody say oh what is bitcoin like every everywhere right. i go everyone i spoke to has heard of it that's right exactly right so everyone's heard of it, and then the next step here is that you know we we have to get people from just having heard of it to um, actually believing in it, using it, and we may you know we, we may be in a case to where most people in the world don't use Bitcoin in a direct way. Maybe they use you know some other technology that's built on top of it, or uh, maybe they have like some limited savings around it, or maybe one of their family members actually has some savings in it, and then you know they themselves use another currency. But everything will somehow interact with it going forward. And, and I think that that's, that's the view is like the awareness is there. And then over time, it's, we're going to go through all of these tests and more and more of the global system, financial system and kind of social systems are going to have more and more dependence on, on Bitcoin. Are you amazed it survived? And, and, and why do you think Bitcoin is so resilient? Because I was looking through some of the, the things that have happened to it, you know, from trust in the technology to things like you know, government cr- crackdowns. We've got Manukin now, kind of hovering around it. We've had China ban it. We've had things such as the Silk Road and Mount Gox. Yet yeah, it is still here. It's still chugging away. Every ten minutes, producing blocks. And dis- despite all those things, are you amazed by its resilience, or or is that something you've come to expect now? I, I think that I am amazed by it. It's. I think it's a similar. It's it's a similar thing to flying in a plane now, right? You know, you fly in a plane all the way around the world. You take off. You land. You take off. You land. And um, it's become such a routine thing now that we don't even think much about it. But if you kind of step back and think, wow, like, you know, I'm flying through the air, hurtling through the air at hundreds of miles per hour and, um, and you know, Watch very skillfully, carefully landing, right? It's, it's, it's a remarkable thing. And I think that we're at this point with Bitcoin to where if you had asked me three, even three or four years ago, you know, would we be this far along around awareness and this far along around um, even adoption and other companies building on top of it, I, you know, I would have told you you're crazy. Uh, so I, I, I do think that from that perspective, it's blown out my proportions or my, my expectations. But I, but I think that um, you know, everybody's so used to it now that we still have a long way to go. Um, so it, it, on the flip side, you know, I also think, again, that we're just getting started. Wow. So just getting started. So one of the questions I often pose to people when I'm traveling around interviewing is like, what does the purpose that Bitcoin serves? And I tend to see two camps. There, there are those that talk about it taking down the central banks and being a brand new financial system. And there's other people who talk about having kind of private money. And I know it serves both, but I also get the feeling that if you prioritize one, it changes the approach approach to it. So for example, if it's t- taking down central banks, I think the focus therefore is, is adoption and you know, focusing on just U- UX, making sure people can get hold of Bitcoin and use it easily. Whereas if you're fo- focusing on 
privacy and and um, censorship resistance, you maybe will tend to focus on uh, other kind of tools, and it kind of changes the direction of things. Where are you in this kind of spectrum of uh, the where where you think Bitcoin is focused? Yeah, I, I think that the reality is that many of these things are going to coexist more than they are. One is just going to rapidly usurp the other. Central banks will continue to exist for, I think, a long time. I think that they will evolve in their role. And um, even Bitcoin itself will be you know, a tool in their kind of tool chest. But what, what will happen is you now have, because it is uh, you know, a global censorship resistant form of money payment uh, payment system, you will have these, you know, pockets of you can you can think of you can think of central banks as being a part of a kind of bigger state organization system, right? That that it governs people, governs businesses, governs things, governs borders, uh, governs military, and um, you know, Bitcoin is this this piece of technology that can now be integrated into that, or it can stand in opposition to that. You know the things, uh, you know, or people can build a totally new type of system, a totally new type of government, kind of on top of Bitcoin and utilizing some of the some of the key pieces, key features of Bitcoin, and that new organization can kind of stand in opposition to the old or, or organizations. But I, but the the general point there is that you know I don't think that central banks are just going to go the way of the dinosaur. Um, I think that that they will evolve, and it's just if they. If they, if they hold their current path and they don't change and they don't evolve, then those central banks that, that just hold their current path are going to die. But the ones that do evolve, even in small ways, will survive and will continue to grow. And these kind of totally new types of organizations built you know, more natively to Bitcoin will probably do uh, or probably survive the best. But you know, it's still to see kind of what that may look like. But we're seeing, we're seeing the early days of that. But it's going to take some time for this to, to play out again. That's why I say we're, we're kind of at the beginning of that. How do you mean we're seeing that play out now already? What kind of things are you seeing? Well, we've already heard of so. So I think that I think that probably the best example of that may actually be Libra, and mm-hmm. I think you know Facebook gets a lot of flack for trying to build Libra, but I do think it's it's if you look at what they're trying to build, I think that it actually has Libra actually has kind of. Maybe it's maybe the way to put it is like the best approach or the best mix of what a uh, kind of future central bank or you know it's because it's programmable and because they're trying to build APIs around it and because it's going to plug into the Facebook system it's um, it's it's not as easy to just say that it's like a central bank because it is it is going to be this currency but it's going to be it's it's at least planned to be uh, more open and and uh, in both a kind of computing system and a, uh, a monetary system, but I but I just think that Libra captures the the same attitude of of kind of what a central bank captures and the same directives to where Bitcoin is is kind of something different. Bitcoin is just going to exist, and it's going to exist even regardless of whether a central bank or a a state human governance system wants to utilize it or not. It's just going to exist. It's just going to be out there, right? And where where Libra is is this kind of digital money uh, organization and this digital money approach. Um, but they are talking about that they're going to have a basket of currencies and Bitcoin could be a part of that, right? So, so if you want to look at you know, stuff that's already happened or the, the adoption that's already happened in the early part of the curve, then a, a very easy example is you know, Libra launches. There's a digital currency that's now a part of 2 billion Facebook users' lives and Bitcoin ends up being part of that basket of currencies, right? Like that's, mm. That is a very real possibility within the next year or two. And I think is is a more near term possibility than say the U.S. government central bank somehow utilizing Bitcoin. Uh, but you know we we have heard I think it was the maybe the Australian central bank uh, one of the other one of the other central banks from another country I think it was Australia had actually talked about maybe even uh, factoring in Bitcoin as a part of their asset holdings. So you know we, we maybe we'll see some of the major central banks actually use it as as an asset too. But we'll see. And do you think they're the central banks that have got the most chance of survival? And then looking at the ones that you think might fail, what does a what does a failing central bank mean? Um, I, I you know a failing central bank looks like a failing state. So if a central bank is just part of the state apparatus in which a country operates, and 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 um, 
and and the goal of a you know a goal of a state should be to operate for the benefit of its people, government for the benefit of its people, uh, its citizens. Uh, then a failing a failing state, and you can go down the list of countries that have inflated away their purchasing power, their currency. Congo, uh, you know, even Venezuela, uh, we've, we've got, there's just numerous cases now. And, and Venezuela is an interesting case because now they've got the Petro. So they're trying to play this game already. And so maybe that, you know, we're, we're still, it's still in the early stages of that. And maybe they see some success with the Petro. But I think that, I think the, the Petro is actually an interesting case because effectively what they're doing is they're playing the digital currency game, but with the gas as a backing, right? With, with their mm-hmm. petroleum as a backing. And that's, they've called it the Petro. And so uh, you can you can see this world starting to emerge to where they, we've even talked about potentially a U.S. digital dollar, um, but I think that I think that that will be a little bit further off. And who knows? Maybe maybe some uh, maybe some central bank will even try to go back into a uh, a gold backed currency at some mm-hmm. point. I, I, I think that no matter what the 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 next five to ten years, you know, if you look at any global reserve currency. No reserve currency has lasted more than about 60, 70 years, uh, if, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. Um, so we've had a series of these global reserve currencies, and the dollar has been the reserve currency uh, for quite a while now. And, and uh, you know, we're actually past those numbers. And so uh, it is, yeah, it, there are ways. There might be other cards that we can play. But, it, it, you know, at least right now, I think that, that our reserve currency status is at risk. And so other countries are also going to be trying different things you know a bitcoin backed central bank in some capacity may be part of that a digital currency from another corporation that somehow has bitcoin at play could be a part of that um a resource backed central bank you know perhaps venezuela is an example of that uh with a digital dollar like the petro maybe an example or maybe a, a, a third version of that and but what we have today with the u.s dollar is we're effectively almost kind of Petro and military backed. Uh, it's just with our alliance with Middle East and um, and you know the might of the U.S. military is what's backing the the dollar. So you have countries like as in El Salvador recently, they're dollarized. Everyone uses the dollar. There's sure. no local currency that people right. use. So they're essentially giving up central banking control of uh, of a currency in the country. They're relying on an, another country. Is it a big leap right. to move to a country that does that with Bitcoin? I think that it's it's a big leap. It is a big leap for that to happen because the, and it would be more similar to just going back to a gold based or hard metal based currency. It limits, you know, what you can do. It, 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 uh, the ability for a country to just kind of print their way out of a crisis. Um, it limits your, uh, so it constrains it constrains a country in ways that they can't just kind of make up their story, right? Uh, because they have a a hard number that they're constantly judged against. But in in certain crises, they still there still will be flexibility. It's not like they're kind of locked into one path. Uh, but it just provides this kind of extra measure. So Bitcoin could end up serving like that. Um, it's still again it's still very early, and a lot of you know there's a lot of global awareness, and I don't think it would shock anyone. If something like that happened within the next five to ten years, um, but I do think that it would scare people. Like I think that a lot of people would think it would be very unpredictable. They're much more comfortable with the idea of something like gold. So I do, I do think it it would be a very, uh, uh, it would be, a, it, it's going to be an experiment. If something like that happens, it's going to be an experiment for sure. So the more likely scenario, therefore, is a kind of gradual transition where, similar to Libra being a basket, maybe a central bank or a government has Bitcoin as as one asset alongside maybe gold and dollar and others. Yeah, I mean, a basket of currencies has been, uh, it, it, this goes, so we have, uh, you know, the International Monetary Fund has special drawing rights, SDRs. Yeah, it, it's, uh, ba- using a basket of currencies has been something that most central banks or kind of global bankers, global governments are aware of and understand and would probably be more comfortable with Um and maybe even more comfortable than just going kind of fully gold back, just in the in the sense that it gives them more flexibility. Um, it really becomes a kind of a battle for gold control. Uh, and if you were to to go back to a um, gold standard, but there and, and so if you kind of went to a Bitcoin standard, 
it would be a battle for for Bitcoin, right? Like, and, and mm-hmm. you know, there is a question of kind of how, what does that look like? What does a a a um, kind of battle for Bitcoin look like in a Bitcoin standard bank? It's kind of Bitcoin standard central bank, and that's going to spark a lot of, you know, maybe that sparks a lot of innovation and in just in terms of hashing power wars. Um, you know, the, the 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 world will look very very different if something like that plays out, but it's not as far-fetched as it used to be because, again, Bitcoin is now, everyone's aware of it. Um, many people are using it. Many people are building on top of it. There's a Microsoft team that's building an identity layer on top of it. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot that's happening. That's, it's, just, it's just shocking how fast we've come in a very short time frame. Next up, I talk to Jeremy more about the future of Bitcoin. But before that, I've got a message from my very amazing sponsors. I love all these guys. Please do check them out. Don't skip this. Make sure you check out the sponsors. And first up, we do have the mighty, mighty Kraken, the best place to buy, sell, and trade Bitcoin. The only place I use now to buy and sell Bitcoin. Consistently rated the best and most secure cryptocurrency exchange. And whatever your level of experience, Kraken has designed and built a streamlined Bitcoin exchange for newcomers and experts alike. Their platform provides world-class financial stability by maintaining full reserves, healthy banking relationships, and the highest standards of legal compliance. They pair their global 247-365 live chat with an extensive support center to help ensure that your questions are answered and your needs are met around the clock, no matter who you are or where you are. And with Kraken Pro, their beautiful mobile-first app, you can trade Bitcoin wherever you want, whether you're on a plane if you're in Starbucks getting a Frappuccino, it doesn't matter. You can be trading Bitcoin wherever you are. So come on, there is no better place to trade Bitcoin. Join me in supporting Kraken by heading over to kraken.com or downloading the app, which is available for the iPhone on Android. Just search for Kraken Pro, which is K-R-A-K-E-N-P-R-O. And next up, we have the amazing BlockFi, the future of Bitcoin and financial services. Do you know what? I should probably switch that up now. I've been saying that for ages. They are really the now of Bitcoin and financial services because they're smashing it. They're killing it. 2019 was a massive year. They killed it with their crypto back loans. They killed it with their interest accounts where you can get interest on your Bitcoin, Ether, and GSD, of which I'm a customer and I've stayed a customer. But they're going to smash it again in 2020. They've just announced they've raised a massive $30 million round to keep scaling the business. And they've got a couple of very cool things coming. Yeah, they got a mobile app, which is going to be super cool. But most importantly, the thing I cannot wait for is they've got their Sats Back Rewards credit card coming. Every time I speak to Zach, I'm like, man, get me that fucking card. I need that Sats Back card. The amount of money I'm spending each year is all going to go on that card, and I'm going to get all those Sats Back. I cannot wait. I want that card as soon as possible. Now, listen, if you want to check out BlockFi, I do recommend you do your own research, but then head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. There's also some social things happening right now and some political things that are happening right now. So I've been traveling, as you know, I've been traveling a lot. I've been to Chile to cover the riots. I went to Venezuela. I've just been out to right. Turkey. I've been, you know, I've traveled to quite a few countries now, but there are some clear parallels. There is a growing left and right divide and a growing anger against inequality. And outside the politics here, whether you believe in socialism or capitalism, what, libertarian, whatever you want, what I, what I don't really care about is 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 your political identity. In this point, is that what there is is this is this left right divide and this rich free poor, and it's a growing divide and there's a growing resentment from people. And as I said, for whatever the politics are, the resentment tends to be it's not so much that of the divide itself, but how the divide occurs, how much corruption is there, how the the people at the kind of bottom rung, especially in places like South America, which has a very small middle class, seem to they feel like they've done their part, they've worked, they've paid their taxes, yet they are having access to less and less services, and the richer get and richer, and yeah. the poorer get and poorer. Where do you feel like Bitcoin fits into that whole narrative that is that is spreading globally? Yeah, so there's a lot embedded in what you just. There's a lot embedded in what yeah, you just walked that. through, and the, the points that I'll touch on. No, no, that's great. That's great. There's a that's a great jumping off point, but there's a lot embedded there, and I, I would say that the the few things to cover there. Are, one is is I've, I've talked before about Bitcoin and, and really any currency. I mean, Bitcoin is just this kind of evolution of currency and is just better money, better currency. And, and when you get into 
what a currency ultimately is just as a it's i mean it's just a communications medium a value transfer communications medium so i want to touch on that um uh and then i also want to touch on the the idea of inequality and the idea of difference and kind of this this political the political battles that are happening but this widening gulf and and kind of you know how political systems work uh, can touch on that a little bit <clears throat> and then can also touch on the uh, this idea of uh, corruption and um, and growth and uh, the middle class and kind of being furious at the fact that you know you're someone who follow the rules and you're you're getting screwed right like the the government or <clears throat> a business interest or someone else is screwing you and and what all that looks like and and I think the first two or three points are, are actually helpful to, to 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 touch on the last one and and what we're seeing with this this um, <clears throat> middle class situation. So, um, uh, Bitcoin as a communications medium and currency as a communications medium. When you get down to what a currency is, it's just a common language. Like that's an easy way to think of it. A a good currency is is a language that anyone understands and it's a language of exchange, right? So if, you know, I'm making apples and you're making corn and I want some corn and you want some apples, then we can do the direct exchange or we can actually have a, you know, this medium of exchange. We can have a uh, currency that sits in between us that is easy to trade with, right? And from that perspective, uh, Bitcoin is really interesting because being open source, and also not being controlled by a singular uh, central party and also having all the stats, everything is an open system, not just that it's open source, but even the running of the system, you know, you can, you can pay attention and you can see what's happening. It's just, it's just way more predictable. So in that, that simple, simple example of, of currency and the, just the ability to trade and exchange, you need to be able to speak the same language, right? And you also need to know that the other person that you're exchanging with is actually following the same rules that you're following. So if I'm, um, you know, I'm expecting that if we're using Peter dollars and I'm expecting the exchange rate to be 10 apples per Peter dollar and you're expecting the exchange rate to be uh, five apples per Peter dollar, then, you know, we've got some, we've got it. We basically have to arrive at a, a middle ground somewhere in terms of the exchange for, for the goods that we're about to make. Um, but if you have this dollar that is giving off enough information and that is an open source system and also a kind of globally scaled, you know, the technology itself and operating the technology is also done in an open, transparent way with this open, transparent ledger. Then what that means is, is that my ability to price, my ability to say and, and predictably say, well, you know, I'm going to price or I'm going to say that the exchange should be 10, dollar, 10 apples per Peter dollar. And it, 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 you have a higher incidence or a higher chance that we're going to be agreeing uh, in terms of an exchange rate, if that makes sense. So it's, it's critical to have this kind of like open money that allows a system to emerge to where two people in two different locations with two totally different backgrounds can arrive at similar estimations. And so like, you know, Bitcoin at its core as a communications medium is remarkable because of that, because it just, it better than any other currency in the world, it, it has this trustability, this predictability, this, and, and anybody can check it any time of the day. We don't have to wait for, you know, quarterly Fed minutes and we don't have to wait for, uh, or emergency Fed action, right? In the, in the, with this recent coronavirus, we can, every day we can just look up the stats, we can learn as much as we want. And, um, and because of that, again, it provides this kind of base open communication medium and what that means is, is that, you know, we, anybody that's dealing in Bitcoin actually feels like they're part of this kind of nation of Bitcoin in a sense. Like they feel like they're part of this community of Bitcoin yeah. and they're already on this, this, this right communication level with the other person that they're dealing with. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what that does is that, that literally, if we're talking about now jumping to the second point of talking about kind of inequality generally, what that does is it builds a bridge, right? So if we're talking about inequality generally and where that arises from, you know, people are just different, right? People, they, they live in different places. They come from different backgrounds. They're uh, genetically and phenotypically very different. People are just different and that's okay. Difference is like great, right? It's like, that's how we end up with 
you know, someone makes uh, metal music and someone makes classical music and someone makes pop music and, you know, all this kind of this, this array of different types of products and music and culture. And, you know, that comes from the fact that we're all different and that's awesome. But we still need this, this kind of common language to trade with and communicate with. And so what I would posit is that at least my, my kind of approach to thinking about the world and, and how this has evolved is that the, the history to date, um, we have been kind of locked in both information and, and locked isn't like the perfect word, but we, we've been, uh, I'll just say that we've been kind of boxed in or, or have been uh, used in these information systems and money systems to date that have been mostly regional, local, or national and have scaled with with different types of money and different types of technology. And, uh, and so one example of that is kind of like the history of newspapers that, you know, every city would have a major newspaper and everybody in that city <clears throat> would read, or, you know, a lot of people in that city would read the city newspaper every week and would kind of know what's going on in that city or that region. Now we're at, uh, instead of at city newspapers, we're at kind of national newspapers or even just global newspapers. Right. Mm-hmm. But the internet is the big, the big kind of missing piece in this story of inequality and this story of difference. When you only had kind of one major information mechanism or one major, you know, you had a narrow set of radio stations, you had a narrow set of movie and, uh, and um, music publishers, you had a narrow set of um, uh, newspapers again, TV channels, radio stations. And uh, now we have this, you know, the internet, which is just makes it easy for millions of these things to exist. And so you have these fracturing communities you have the uh, – maybe a good example of this is, is the uh, – not, not Vox, but what's the other uh, – the publisher's name? BuzzFeed? BuzzFeed, yeah, like BuzzFeed quizzes. There you go. Like BuzzFeed quizzes are like an, a perfect example of this is that you have this – you have just millions and millions of these sub-communities that can now exist because of the internet. And, and the, you know, the potential, I think, for all these sub-communities was always there. The potential was always there. You had a lot of differences in between people, but because everybody was only, you know, using this newspaper or using this news channel or using this community, you know, all these differences were kind of getting smoothed over. But now because of the internet, people can engage with people around the world and they're like little hundred group of people that like some anime or some book or some music or whatever that is. And they can form these, these tiny little subgroups. And so you get these more and more kind of cultural manifestations that come out. And each of those cult- cultural manifestations, that's, that's a difference, right? And so you, the internet brings out more detail, more informational detail in the global populace. And that's the kind of root problem that ultimately has kind of resulted in the, a lot of the clashes, I think, that we, we see both in culture and politics um, and elsewhere is that, you know, the internet is enabling us to kind of finally realize a lot of the idea differences that we've had for a long time people are kind of finally comfortable saying like, yeah, I believe this or I believe that um, because of the fact that they can find other people too that are a part of that community. They can engage with them. They can grow those ideas. So the internet itself is part of the mechanism that's, that's kind of expanded the range of possible ideas. So that's point number two. Point number one was, again, that, that kind of any good currency is a good communications mechanism is ultimately what it is. Um, that allows two people to trade and have a common language that they can trade in. And now point number two is with the internet growing, you now have this massive, uh, this massive engine that's creating differences between people, right? Mm-hmm. So that gets us to point number three, which you're, you, know, you brought up about the widening gulf in wealth and the widening gulf in kind of political spectrum, political views, political clashes, and then also even uh, this question of middle class versus upper, cl- upper class and you know, middle class, uh, first off, like middle class was uh, largely created during the, the Industrial Revolution um, kind of as a function of these jobs that were in factories and, and um, that were needed even, uh, you know, for the kind of global system to work. But the middle class hasn't always been there historically. So you've had kind of multiple tiers of wealth, but the middle class hasn't always been there. But I'm just raising that point because it's, it, uh, it is a – you know, historically, it, it wasn't always there. There's no guarantee it'll stay there. But I think that the, the more important point here is like, is with this new range and differences of ideas and cultures and everything else, it makes it harder than ever for us to communicate. It makes it harder than ever for us to politically organize 
it makes it harder than ever to, um, it makes it easier than ever for, for people to actually make contact, but it makes it harder than ever for you to get kind of large swaths of people to be extremely highly engaged in communities. Right. And so what's resulted in that is that you've needed, you've had politicians and others that have created this kind of outrage culture and uh, political infighting as a way to like band people together through fear. And, you know, Bitcoin or good currency actually provides us a way out of that because as a common language, you're already part of a group. So if you like, if you, if you participate in this common language, this common currency, this common community, regardless of what your belief set is or your political set, um, then you, you can communicate, you can trade, you can, you know, have friendly relations. So, um, I know that's a, that's a, that was a long stretch to, to run through those three <laughs> points, but I think that just, just leading all that up to say that, that the answer to, you know, this wealth inequality, the answer to, you know, getting screwed if you're part of the middle class because you think you're playing by the rules, but it turns out that the rules weren't what, the, what you thought they were. If you have open money, if you have an open system, if you have Bitcoin and you have an open system to where communication is easier, to where, you know, the, the average middle class person can check uh, Bitcoin, can look at basic stats, can make sure it's running just as well as the, you know, more wealthy classes or lower income classes, they can all do this, right? They can all understand and see how that money is reacting to world events on the same level, then it reduces the opportunities or reduces the chances that there, there would be a, um, you know, some kind of a scheme going on to, um, uh, kind of hoodwink one of the middle classes, lower classes, whatever, right? Like, so because it is a common communications mechanism, because it is a reliable, boring, uh, stable asset and system, um, that makes it easier or, 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 or lowers the risk of being hoodwinked. So it's, it goes back to having the best form of money, but but the open transparency allow. I, I kind of I think you're, what you're saying is, you can't hide the corruption. Yeah, you can't even hide it. Yeah, it's it that that's exactly right. Like it because it is an open system, it is harder to hide that because it is um, because of the censorship resistance, it is harder to hide corruption. Just across the board, the existence of Bitcoin as a system, not just as money, but as a you know as a communication and computation system, with money being a part of that means that it is harder to hide corruption. And it will be increasingly. I mean, you will have potentially, maybe they'll, they'll have to, uh, I, I mean, you'll still see, um, <clears throat> you'll still see some uh, central banks, you'll still see corruption in other types of forms, but you know, this particular type of corruption will be harder to run. Yeah, and I, I guess added into that is that you know, a lot of the corruption stems from the ability to control the money, to print the money as you need. We know with Bitcoin, that's one of the problems that you have to you have to have a little more of fiduciary responsibility. Yeah, but it's it's also it's like uh, you know it's not even just the money system; it's a legal system as well. You have, <clears throat> and there's an interaction between that where you have maybe certain parties that are are politically immune from their actions and can be corrupt because they either have enough money or they have enough political clout or they're a part of a, you know, they have enough force, like they may be a part of a military in a certain country or, or they may be a part of the, um, the legal function. Right. Um, so there, there are several of those levers that you could have a tight hold on or be a critical part of that could give you some level of immunity, which would enable you to run some corruption if you wanted to. And Bitcoin by being this open system, you can't change it. You can't, you know, no party has that level or that ability to corrupt things. And if they do make any changes, it's immediately apparent, right? So it's not, it's not, it doesn't say that, uh, that things will never change or that there won't be attempts at corruption. But what it does say is that if that happens, that it will be able to be immediately detectable or near immediately detectable. And, and then that again, will kind of reduce the, the potential corruption overall. And, and I don't know exactly what that means in terms of how things would play out with the widening wealth gap, I expect that the, or, or I suspect, I won't say I expect, but I suspect that the wealth gap will actually get wider over time just because of the way kind of capital systems work, but it's still to be seen. Do you think this will change the nature of politicians and politics itself and the way the expectation and of behavior will have from politicians? Well, I guess we have the expectation now, but we're always let down, but do you think this will change the nature of politics? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, it definitely will. Uh, we're already seeing that some. 
you know, I, I, I would say that one way to think about all of this stuff is just an open system versus a closed system. Mm-hmm. And what, what, meaning, what meaning there is two things. One is an open system being just like something that's transparent that you can see kind of how the system's running. Two being a, you know, and a closed system being something that's closed off and you can't even see the rules, right? Um, mm-hmm. But there's another way to look at that in saying that, that an open system may have the rules on the surface and the rules that you see are also the rules on how things actually work. Where a closed system also could be something to where, you know, there may be some public rules that it appears that things work in a certain way, but in reality, there's this kind of second rule set that's kind of hidden, and and that's how things, you know, really work. And I would say that, like, the politics of today, if you're a politician or if you're a governor in some capacity, and whether you're in China or you're in the U.S., we are in political systems currently where they are, even if they're democratic— Many of them are still, in, a, in effect, kind of more closed systems. Not in the sense that you can't see some of the things that are going on, but in the sense that the things you see are not necessarily the real story. Okay. Can you explain that? Yeah. Well, well I mean, let's just look at um, the financial crisis, for instance, right? You know, we can all see that money was printed. We can all see, you know, some of the details of, of – you know, what happened, but we have no idea what was said in back rooms. We have no idea the nuances of what happened in both at the governance level, some of the corporate level, some of the bailout level. Uh, we know that certain, you know, very few people went to jail. We know that, you know, based on the legal structure that many people should have gone to jail, mm-hmm. but it, they didn't, right? And we have no idea kind of what those backroom situations were, even though the the public is being told like, hey, um, you know, this is good for everyone and this is what's happened, there's some backroom understanding that if you were a part of one of those banks, then you really have the real knowledge as to what kind of really happened. And what, you know, that's, that's the story of, of governance kind of throughout history is it's, it's almost always been kind of two layers of one that's been more like the kind of, okay, this is the public story. And then one that's been below the surface is the reality. And this is, you know, this goes back to just like even the allegory, you know, Plato's cave. But I think that ultimately any system uh, governance system, monetary system, anything to where the reality and the kind of public view are closer and closer and closer or are the exact same, that's a more open system, right? And in that more open system, you know, the the, the, the closer those two are, uh, and, it, and it could be a function of just the way the system's designed, the better. Because you can't get away with as egregious of abuses. It's much harder for uh, sociopaths and other kind of corrupt individuals to manipulate a system to where things are just much more open. And therefore, people actually trust that system more and more and more. And so Bitcoin is one of those where, again, it's it's an open system, it's open source, but also just the operations of the system generally are easy to see. And it doesn't mean things that won't change. It doesn't mean people won't try to corrupt it. But if they do, it's very easy to detect that and see that and to see the kind of public story of maybe some of the core developers or someone else diverging from the reality of what you're seeing with the kind of underlying code and underlying behavior of the system, right? So mm-hmm. that, that, that fact of like the story uh, diverging from reality is, is harder to happen. And therefore, you know, talking about um, politics and talking about what, you know, what you ask, I do think it will be harder for politicians to, uh, to, to be corrupt. Um, doesn't mean they won't try, but at least in this area, um, it will be uh, harder potentially in the future because of this. Okay, just just moving to a slightly separate subject, but I think it's aligned to this, is that the world's pretty weird right now, Jeremy. It's, it feels like it's the weirdest time I've ever lived. Uh, I, I've seen that there are certain governments now who are starting to even try and clamp down on cryptography. They want full access to all our money, our information, our data. This real kind of dystopian futures feels like it's encroaching right on us now i I think i saw a thing in the u.s where they're trying to ban all forms of cryptography Uh, i'm pretty sure australia banned it i think the uk tried to in 2015 you know there's a lot of weird things happening right now you know add to that we have data hacks you know i talked about uh, protests uh, across the world Uh, the real standout one for me was uh, hong kong where people actually kind of the hong kong protesters kind of won you know, they actually got the uh, Chinese government to back down. But there's a lot of really, right. really weird stuff going on right now. Do you see Bitcoin as a reflection of that? Or do you see Bitcoin as a, 
um, as a tool to support that or just both? Um, I, I mean, it's independent of that, right? If anything, I would say that those things would have happened in some capacity. It's just that Bitcoin actually, because because what that's a result of, I oh, you know what? There there's a there was a third part of our discussion just a, a minute ago, which is basically you know the nature of economic growth that we should factor into that, and and this and and this actually factors into this question is that you know if the pie if 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 there's this this kind of courtroom that I that I do believe that if the economic pie does not continue to grow, then you're going to get a lot of bad things happen. If you, you you end up in this Malthusian kind of cutthroat world where everybody's trying to get their piece, but if you're growing the overall economic picture, economic pie, then everybody can kind of have their slice, their little piece of, of, of the growth, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I, I don't think Bitcoin is just this tool that, that was, you know, thanks Satoshi Nakamoto, it was given to us in recognition of like, okay, you know, the, the world monetary system, the world governance system is getting really complicated. It wasn't, I do think it was in response to some of the corruption, but it itself kind of exists independent of that corruption. Uh, it may exacerbate and make that, uh, I, I don't think that Bitcoin itself is exacerbating and making that corruption faster, but I think the existence of that, me, uh, of Bitcoin means that people can now believe in an alternative or they can believe that something else is possible, mm-hmm. right? And but the, the 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 root of the problem really comes down to uh, economic growth. If you have really strong economic growth, then population is generally much much easier to manage. Uh, you know, people are much happier. Um, if you have stagnation, which is what you know, I, I do believe that we're seeing in many economies and many areas around the world. The, and 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 you know, you're not growing as fast, or you're not growing at all. Then you're going to get major protests. You're going to get, you know, people can't feed their families and people can't even grow families. Then people are not going to be happy, and that's going to result in more protests. That's going to result in more demands for more rights to, for for people to eventually get those things back, uh, that personal wealth back. And so Bitcoin feeds into that. Um, it may exacerbate it a little bit, but ultimately, like that's the root problem is that that growth problem. Right. Okay. And you know kind of timely now we're we're going to potentially have a what a very serious problem economically we have coronavirus sure so resulting from that i guess if we do see significant impact on the global economy we're going to see you know perhaps not even that that we're not going to see growth we're actually going to see the economy shrink so that could be a throw more fuel onto the fire of these types of protests yeah so the weird thing about coronavirus actually is that you know, I, I mean, have you heard? Have you seen any uh, headlines about protests recently in in Hong Kong? Well, actually, I I just read about one yesterday. They just started again. That was interesting that you should ask that because they had stopped, but uh, yeah, they've just started again. Well, we'll see how this plays out. But you know, there were and there there are still some in in Europe um, right now. But as coronavirus grows, you know, you may actually see a limiter in terms of. Uh, public kind of mass gathering protests doesn't mean protests will stop. Protests may may happen in other ways, but they're going to have to manifest themselves in a in a different different way. But you know, coronavirus is going to wreak havoc on the overall system. We've known for a very long time that that another major virus was a risk to the global population. We've been connecting and interconnecting and moving towards this globalist. Um, uh, system and that makes the spread of virus. It makes the spread of capital and the spread of money and the spread of trade much easier, which helps solve some growth if you can sell to more people. But it doesn't necessarily uh, doesn't necessarily. But it also opens up this weakness which we have not seen majorly exposed, which is you know this potential of of mass pandemic. So it is a real challenge that we now have this reality of. Uh, and I'll go ahead and call it a reality of of mass pandemic. I know the World Health Organization has been like hesitant, but I, I, I mean it's a it's a pandemic. It's it's everywhere. It's crazy. And I think that, that that this is still very early in the process of coronavirus. I think it is going to change a lot of our lives, but it's not. You know, a lot of people are thinking, oh, this will just be one of the flus, or this will just be the next few months. But I don't think that's the case. I think that this has been a risk for quite a while. Um, it's been a potential for quite a while. We just haven't had it. You know, again, manifest itself, and it's not going to go away. Now that it is, now that we've seen it once, you know, I do think that you know, coronavirus itself may just flare back up 
again, there may be a second or third wave of it, but I do think that in this more globalized world that this will continue to be a potential risk. So we're going to have to come up with new ways of doing things, and maybe that's social isolation. Maybe we have some new cultural norms that 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 come out or limits to mass conferences and mass events. But you know, something's going to have to change uh, to protect us from that while still enabling the growth picture. So it's you know going to be twice as hard now. We have to both maintain a growth picture, maintain more innovation to grow the economy overall while still minimizing the risk of something like this. And that is going to be hard. And as more people face hardship, they're going to want to protest or they're going to want to find some way out. And that will find either it's either going to be, you know, riots or it's going to be protests or it's going to be there's going to be something that happens. Um, so whoever is in the, who, who is ever whoever is in any kind of political office or leadership office in the next few years is going to be, it's going to be a real challenge, real challenge for whoever's in office. Yeah. So if somebody new was listening to this podcast and they've gone through the beginner's guide, most of the time they're going to be thinking that, look, this is a new form of money. It's a better form of money, perhaps a way to take down the central banks. But always with you, Jeremy, I'm always thinking much bigger. I'm thinking this is a complete change to society. This, like that show we made, it, it changes everything. How do you get people to think beyond just being a change to money? I, I think that there's something that happens. It's hard to replace the actual activity the first time someone actually kind of holds their keys. Mm-hmm. Um, whether you do that on a Trezor or on, you know, we have Keymaster Multisig. And, and if you, you know, set up a Multisig system and, you know, you realize that you have the ability to be your own bank, that itself is just a remarkable step. Now, getting people to that point is 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 still a little bit of a hurdle. We're trying to make that easier uh, at Casa, but it's still a hurdle. And and but once someone has that experience, there is a light bulb that goes off, and it's hard to replace that by just explaining something. And unfortunately, I think that that's you know that's it, it is going to take building kind of new experiences or having new things. It's gonna it's gonna take uh, it'll take several more years for us to have some of these new technologies or new things that that can result from a system like this before uh, most people really understand it. Um, and so it's it's not easy to explain, and I don't necessarily have an answer for you as to how to mm-hmm. to just, you know, get people to grok it immediately other than just, okay, you know, here, set up a key. Here, I'm going to send you some funds. You know, you just transfer $10,000 instantly, and it's um, uh, very low fee, and you control it entirely. And, uh, you know, you don't have a lot of cash on you. And that's, 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 a, that's the most remarkable thing. Yeah. Okay, so looking forward, you know, I, I, I did say this would be about the future of Bitcoin. We've covered a lot of the political and social elements here. Just on a technology level, you said it's going to be quite a boring few years ahead. But what are the, some of the most important things coming for the technology of Bitcoin? The most significant is, is, uh, is just taproot and, uh, you know, Schnorr signatures Near term improvements on um, in terms of signing, potentially uh, there are some privacy implications there that are important too. Um, there are, you know, I, I think that that more than uh, the technology layer itself will be, you know, pretty boring, and that's a that that's a feature, right? Like that's a good thing mm-hmm. that it's not going to change dramatically. But I think that you will see some of the uh, systems around it change, the user interfaces around it. The way people use it again, you know, trying to get more multi-sig, more multi, uh, you know, uh, multiple key signing and, and easier key management. Um, that's what we're spending a lot of time on. Then you have, I, I think that the the hashing power conversation is going to be something really interesting over the next few years. You have more miners coming online. You have more technology around mining, and some of those innovations are actually around power consumption or where you're sourcing that power. You know that's going to be an interesting story the next few years, but again, uh, you know, Bitcoin is going to be boring, and that's a good thing. And I and I, you know, I always try to kind of um, package these uh, nuggets into or or, or, or bits of um, knowledge into easy kind of sayings. And two of my more recent ones are, you know, uh, Bitcoin is going to be boring, and that's that's a good thing. And um, the, the uh, second one is, uh, you know, kind of bet on balkanization. Which balkanization is just means like kind of fracturing in terms of uh, states and uh, more isolation, more independence, and I think that that's that's has implications for how Bitcoin is is structured and how mining will be structured and how some of those other pieces of the Bitcoin system will be structured. All right, so listen, look, nobody nobody likes predictions, Jeremy. <laughs> nobody wants to because you always get help sure. to them, but. 
But just thinking ahead, like one year, 10 years, 50 years, where do you see Bitcoin? And I know that's a massive question. And don't worry, I'm not going to come back in 50 years and go, look, mate, you were wrong. But uh, where do you <laughs> see it? Well, so somebody, somebody will. Somebody will. Yeah, um, I'll be, I'll probably but I, be it's, I, I think that, yeah, I think that the, uh, the prediction game is, is a hard one. And, and honestly, it's, it's kind of an, an unproductive one. And what I would just say is that, that it almost doesn't matter. I think that the thing that I can definitely predict in 25 years is that Bitcoin will be around. I can predict uh-huh. that. Um, I can predict that, um, you know, basically short of short of kind of collapse of internet and power consumption and some massive, massive casualty event that results in just massive kind of catastrophic failure of a lot of our other civilizational systems, Bitcoin will be around, right? Like that's that's the one kind of thing is that there is this kind of codependence, interdependence between Bitcoin and between the the, the kind of uh, social and economic system and the civilization that we have. And so if that collapses, then sure, there's a risk of Bitcoin also collapsing. But as long as those two are alive, like that, it's going to be around, it's going to be growing, um, you know, in 25 years, 10, even 10 years, the banking systems will have all changed and will have all realized and, and further internalized the reality of Bitcoin. And so you will see some very different systems there. Um, I do think that we're going to have We'll still have some, we'll still have corruption, but I do think that we will at least see, I'll I'll put it this way, I think in the next 10 years and maybe even the next five, we will at least see at least one wave of kind of mass outing of corruption. Let's put it that way, like like on a kind of global scale and whether that's tied to the current banking system or or, uh, you know, a few, uh, another nation state that's collapsing or something else happening, you will see these waves of corruption being outed, right? It doesn't mean that the corruption is going to totally go away, but just that corruption being outed means that some of those systems are starting to fail. And that as a result, um, you know, those people are outed only after kind of that, that, that stuff has failed. And, 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 and so you'll get to, I do think that we'll see kind of more stable systems long term. I think that we'll see a a more peaceful future in a lot of ways long term as some of these things are, uh, realign, but it's in that chaos of realignment that things are going to be uh, complicated. On the Bitcoin specific side, I do think that there's no way around people managing keys in some capacity. So that's something that, you know, again, at Casa, we've invested a lot of time in and we were doubling down on this year. And um, uh, Nick and Jameson are leading the charge there. I'm, I'm serving as an advisor mainly. I, I step back mm-hmm. again as a um, uh, for for family health reasons, had a, a family member that got sick, and but on the uh, key master side, I mean, we've been spending a lot of time. Uh, we just shipped some inheritance services. We just shipped some other stuff. I'm gonna just go ahead and do a a little uh, shameless plug around Casa, but I do think that usability around Bitcoin is important. But just usability around key signing more widely is is going to be really important for the future of Bitcoin and the future of a lot of systems and a lot of kind of personal data and personal wealth for people. So I do think that that we will get to kind of mass adoption and mass thinking around key signing and key management. And I think that overall, a computing experience is going to change pretty dramatically. I, I would predict it and expect that at least one of the major uh, kind of fang type companies, you know, you've got Facebook and Google, Amazon, at least one of those will kind of go the way of Kodak and being uh, uh, and losing a lot of market share or just totally collapsing or something. Just as, again, I think all the computing stuff is actually intricately tied into the monetary system as well and how things work. And so as Bitcoin grows, you know, again, companies are going to have to adapt to. So I, there's going to be a lot of activity. I think Bitcoin itself is going to be relatively boring. That's a great thing. Uh, you know, better on balkanization. And um, we're going to see more isolation and coronavirus is accelerating that. But overall, I think the future is quite bright. And, uh, and I'm very optimistic for where things are going in terms of our, you know, personal wealth and family wealth. Um, there's going to be a bumpy road to get there. And, but we've all got to, you know, as Bitcoiners and as one big community, we've all got to kind of band together and uh, work together to, to build this better future. Cool. And if people like what you've got to say, Jeremy, I'm going to recommend our other shows. But if you got any like specific books or specific bits of literature you'd recommend reading, you know, we'll throw Snow Crash in there. But anything else you think people should take a, a, a read of? Oh, that's a that's an interesting one. I I mean, uh, Sovereign Individual is an interesting one, but I do think that one's kind of starting to get overplayed. And there's a lot in there that's you know as much as there is in there that that is an interesting prediction. There's a lot in there that's just kind of totally missed. 
One that I have consistently recommended the last few years is uh, a thousand years of nonlinear history, um, just talking about kind of systems theory more generally. And I think that I think that that um, that is one thing that people can dig into a little bit. I mean, it's it's uh, there is some density around that, but I think that uh, that thinking as thinking of all these things as kind of just systems that are either open or closed, you know, more predictable or not, and are either resilient or not, uh, or let's call it more or less resilient because the, the not, the non-resilient systems, uh, tip, are, are typically gone pretty quick. Uh, but you know, more or less resilient. I think it, the more you look at the world that way and just see Bitcoin, it's not, it's not that like Bitcoin is the end all be all. It's that Bitcoin is just the most resilient thing that's out there. Right. So it's going to survive. And I think that digging into any books or topics, just in terms of systems theory and systems thinking, and and again, my, one of my favorite ones is a thousand years of nonlinear history, is is definitely something to, to to try to invest in or wrap your head around. All right, cool. Well, listen, always love talking to you. Um, usually prefer when we do it in person. It's uh, strange to do it remotely. It's, a, it's always a different experience, but always love talking to you about Bitcoin, Jeremy. You always get me super hyped about the future. So, thank you. And listen, I wish you the best, and I'm sure I'll see you again pretty soon. Well, hopefully, it depends on all the travel stuff, but hopefully, hopefully, I'll see you soon. Yeah, yeah, we might we might be seeing each other. Uh, you know, get your VR headset. Yeah. Jameson has been uh, doing. I, I think they actually have. Uh, uh, they're doing a, an MIT Bitcoin thing with like a virtual meetup. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of these kind of virtual meetups. So whether I see you uh, in the metaverse, which is the, you know, the, the, the space from snow crash, the metaverse or, or, or in real space, you know, either way, look forward to, to connecting. Thanks for having me on. And yeah, really interested to see where all this stuff uh, plays out in the next few years and uh, everybody stay safe. I mean, all this coronavirus stuff is no joke. Everybody should be taking it seriously. So, but yeah, we'll leave it at that. All right, man. Well, good luck and I'll speak to you soon. All right. Take care. Okay, so what did you make of that one? This is the fourth time Jeremy has been on the show, and every time it's been a monster. So you should go back and check the other shows out if you haven't listened to them before. But I knew I had to have him as part of the Beginner's Guide. And looking ahead at the future of Bitcoin was the perfect show for Jeremy because outside of these shows, I've hung out with him a few times. We've had dinner, we've had coffee, and just hearing the way he thinks about the future and where Bitcoin fits into the world is always interesting. He always blows my mind. Now listen, trying to predict the future of what Bitcoin will look like in 5, 10 or even 50 years is almost impossible. But I think it's clear that the future is looking pretty good for Bitcoin and Jeremy is bullish and I am bullish. And world events, just look at what's going on in the world this year, man. It's been a crazy year. I think more than ever, you know we need Bitcoin. And actually, go and check out Why We Need Bitcoin by Andreas if you haven't listened. If you have, go and listen again. If you listen twice, go and listen to it 10 times. You know we need Bitcoin. Anyway, thanks as ever for listening and supporting the show. You got any feedback, you know you can email me. I do reply to anyone except morons who say stupid shit. So if you want to reach out to me, hit me up. It's hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And if you want to support the show, whatever you want to do, if you like the show and you think, you know what, Pete, you do a good job here. I want to help you out, buddy. Please head over to my website. It's whatbitcoindid.com. Click on the support section. It's all in there. Go and lend us a hand. Give us a review on iTunes. Anything you do that can help. Anyway, we've got one show to go. It's going to be a monster. I cannot wait to get it out. It's going to be out on Friday. Looking forward to that. Anyway, if you've got any questions, you can hit me up. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. 